and welcome to Network Commons. This is the Build Healthy Places Network's live discussion series on cross-sector strategies to improve neighborhood health and well-being. My name is Rini Roy Elias. I'm the Director of Research and Advisory Services at the Build Healthy Places Network, and I'll be serving as today's moderator on how community developers can leverage their expertise and assets for partnerships with hospitals and healthcare systems. For those of you who are new to the Build Healthy Places Network, we are the national center at the intersection of community development and health, leading a movement to accelerate investment and speed and spread solutions for building healthy and prosperous communities. We do this by engaging across sectors, educating leaders, and synthesizing best practices for the field. And we're, we're based in San Francisco, but today we're actually joining you from downtown Oakland at the headquarters of the Public Health Institute, which is our fiscal sponsor. And we are actually right outside the parade for the Warriors, so you will hear some celebratory cheers um, perhaps throughout today's event, but we will do our best to minimize any background noise. Um, but we're, we're excited that we're joining you on such a, a, a big day for, for Oakland and for California. So much of our work is guided by what we are seeing as a national movement of cross-sector collaboration where community development corporations, CDCs, community development financial institutions, CDFIs, are working with hospitals and healthcare systems on place-based neighborhood initiatives such as affordable housing, grocery stores, community facilities, and others. However, there are still untapped opportunities for the field at large. And over the past year, we've been approached by a number of community developers seeking guidance on how to even start a conversation with hospitals. So in response, we started an advisory services program specifically to help community developers to make their pitch to hospitals. You can learn more about our customized pitch decks on our website. Given the demands for this work, we took many of the elements of these customized pitch decks and created our healthcare playbook for community developers as a resource for the community development field at large. The full report will be released this summer, but in the meantime, you can check out our four step path to partnership, which my colleague Allison Moore will share in more detail today. The project has been in the works for about a year, so I'm particularly excited to give you the sneak peek today. To complement our discussion about the playbook, we're very lucky to have three community development leaders here with us today who will share their experiences working with hospitals and healthcare systems, and they will also provide some practical tips for how you too can get into the partnership game. You can read our speaker's full bios by clicking on the links that you'll see shortly in your chat box, but I'd also like to provide brief introductions before starting our discussion. First, I'd like to welcome Chris Iglesias, CEO of the Unity Council, a nonprofit social equity development corporation that has served Oakland's Fruitvale neighborhood for 50 years to promote social equity and improve quality of life by building vibrant communities where everyone can work, learn, and thrive. And Chris is actually joining us today um, while his team is participating in the Warriors Parade right outside our doors. So we're especially grateful that he's joining us on this, this big day for all of us. The Unity Council is well known for its role in initiating and developing the Fruitvale Transit Village a national model of equitable transit-oriented development. The Unity Council also provides a wide range of services to mitigate the intergenerational transmission of poverty, spanning early childhood, youth mentorship, workforce development, asset building, and others. We've been working with Chris on a customized pitch deck, and he's making great headway engaging with hospitals, so I'm particularly excited to have him here today to share his insights. Next, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Latimer Nelligan, who is joining us today from New York City. Kim is Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of the Low Income Investment Fund, or LIF, where she oversees the organization's community investment programs. Under Kim's leadership, LIF launched its Fresh Food, Community Health Collaborative, 
and Health and Housing Innovation Initiative, and also opened lending offices in Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. Prior to her time at Lyft, Kim spent over 20 years at Citibank in various leadership capacities as a lender. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Camilla Wood. Camilla is based in Palo Alto, where she is Senior Vice President of Health and Housing at Stewards for Affordable Housing, a national nonprofit collaborative of 13 affordable housing providers who own more than 130,000 affordable rental homes. At SAFE, Camilla facilitates partnerships with the health sector and also informs policymakers on critical issues on the intersection of health and housing. Camilla is also a practicing pediatrician, and she has extensive experience working in public policy and public health at the federal level. And finally, I'd like to introduce Allison Moore, Research Associate at the Build Healthy Places Network. Allison is a recent, recent graduate of the UC Berkeley Master of City Planning and Public Health Dual Degree Program. She has been an indispensable member of our team, supporting a number of research projects and publications, including our Environmental Scan of Healthy Communities Initiatives and a journal article on the Healthy Communities Movement recently published in the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco's Community Development Investment Review. Allison also authored the Healthcare Playbook for Community Developers under the direction of the Build Healthy Places Network team, and the playbook also served as the basis for her master's thesis. Before kicking off our discussion, I want to thank all of you who submitted questions while registering for the event. And for those of you who want to share questions or comments now, you can use the Q&A option that shows up on the side of your screen. Please note this is separate from the chat box. We'll also be using Twitter, so you can send us and the rest of the world messages um, that way too by using the hashtag network comments, all one word. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. So to start off, I'd, I'd like to start by hearing from Allison Moore, author of the Healthcare Playbook. Allison, can you tell us a bit more about your process for developing the playbook and how you came up with the four-step path for partnership? Certainly. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Rainey. Uh, so as you mentioned, the playbook and the four-step checklist kind of came out of the growing realization from both healthcare and community development that the work that they do is really compatible. And this is because the roots of good health are the same as the roots of opportunity and economic prosperity. So the social determinants of health, quality housing, um, schools, well-paying jobs, healthy foods, all of those play a part in determining your health outcomes. And many times hospitals and community development organizations may be serving the same neighborhoods or even the same people. And as anyone in, working in this space knows, these big problems like health inequities and poverty can't be solved by just one organization. And bringing people together with unique capabilities, resources, and experiences means the opportunity to have a more significant and sustainable impact on these multifaceted issues. So despite this compatibility, community development and healthcare, particularly hospitals, may not know what opportunities for collaboration look like, what each sector's motivations are, or where to even begin in making an introduction. Many of these community development and health partnerships that have emerged are also relatively new. Um, so to go about supporting these partnerships, we developed this playbook. And the playbook draws from a number of fantastic existing resources already out there from the Build Health Challenge, the Urban Institute, Leading Age, Democracy Collaborative, the De Beaumont Foundation, Low Income Investment Fund, and Mercy Housing, among others, um, in addition to over 30 interviews with healthcare, community development, and public health professionals. And with this playbook, we really wanted to provide an action-oriented guide that captured the unique capacity of different kinds of community development organizations. And so while the playbook focuses on CDCs, CDFIs, and affordable housing developers as our primary audience, there's still utility for a range of other types of organizations. So public health foundations, healthcare. Um, if you're an organization listening to this webinar, you're, you're going to find utility in this. And um, 
So those that are interested in learning more about what community development organizations bring to the table, um, this can help you understand what, um, how to make a more sustained impact. So as part of the playbook, we developed the four-step guide to partnership, walking in community development organization through the steps for partnership, because as we know, it doesn't happen overnight. So just in quickly walking through the steps, the first step is to kind of ask yourself um, a more fundamental question. Does your organization want to more intentionally address the social determinants of health? And do you have the capacity to do so? Do you have the staff, the time, the resources? Step two involves determining who in your area might be a good partner. This involves taking a look at what hospitals or other health partners have been doing to address population health. So take a look at who they've been partnering with. What areas do they focus on? It's also helpful to take a larger look at the policy landscape in your state around community benefit. And that's what a nonprofit hospital must give back to communities as part of their tax exemption. Or take a look at if there are any Medicaid payment initiatives. Step three involves finding the right person within the hospital or healthcare organization to connect with. How do you frame your capacities in a compelling way, depending on who you're talking to? What are the immediate overlapping areas of interest that you might find? Finally, step four is about building and strengthening your partnership. This requires frank discussions about roles, resources, and capacity of partner organizations. How are you going to define and measure success? in the short term, medium term, and in the future? How are you going to plan for transitions and partnership? So in addition to these four steps, the extended playbook also discusses challenges and strategies to overcome them and be on the lookout. And I also wanna just make note that in the checklist, we also provide um, the names of a number of resources that can help you go more in depth for each stage of partnership. Great. Thank you, Allison. And I, I do want to mention, um, you know, the four step path to partnership and the playbook, you know, do kind of emphasize the, you know, the, the value of, of deepening partnership, deep, deepening relationships between community development and health. But partnerships are, are really looked at as a means to an end. Ultimately, you know, what we all care about is having the kinds of impacts on a poverty and poor health that actually make a dent in kind of the huge problems that we have in this country around healthcare expenditures and um, intergenerational poverty. So, you know, even though there is this emphasis on the partnerships, you know, we, that, doesn't, that doesn't preclude us from thinking about the out outcomes can, that can be achieved through partnership. And we're gonna get back to that a little bit later in the Q&A as well. So now I'd like to turn it over to our speakers to share more about how their organizations have engaged with hospitals and healthcare systems for place-based initiatives to improve health and well-being. Chris, let's start with you. As a long-standing neighborhood level CDC, how has the Unity Council engaged with hospitals and healthcare systems in the past? And what is your future vision for partnerships? Thanks, Jenny. Um, really appreciate uh, the invite to, to be on this webinar. It, it's our first, my first webinar, so I'm kind of excited about this. Um, and the Warriors Parade, too. I keep, I keep getting text messages from my, from my team, like they're getting all set up and getting ready to go down the, in the parade. But anyway, um, so I think for me, I've been here at the Unity Council now for five years. And when I got here, I don't, you know, you know we're a CDC. Um, I think we've really, I think, evolved, you know, through our um, strategic planning process in partnership with a nonprofit finance fund. And I think we really, I think we're really more of a, like a social equity development corporation. But when I got here, there wasn't a lot of talk about health and, and our role in the health world, right? And even our partnership with the hospital, I always felt was a one-way street. It was like, I would pay Kaiser a boatload of money every month to cover our employees. And then they would, <clears throat> you know, uh, give us a sponsorship for our big Dia de los Muertos event in November. And it wasn't really until we started working with them, I think a little more closely and, and kind of strategizing with them about all of our different programs and the impact it has on, on health, at the health of our clients in these neighborhoods around housing, um, this, the school-based health programs that we do through the Latino Men and Boys program. I mean, it, it was like the health is all around us, but I think we, don't, we never really looked at ourselves like that. And it wasn't, I think, till, um, working with nonprofit finance fund, and then finally with you know, building Healthy Places Network, and we actually started mapping it out and we would see the impact 
that all of our different programs have, whether it's early childhood education and our partner with, our partnership with Children's Hospital and La Clinica de la Raza, um, and then our youth programs, our senior programs, our senior house, our senior center, which is constantly in partnership with um, the Alameda County Public Health. And you know, once you start putting it down on paper, you realize, wow, I mean, we, we, we do play a major role in this. And even in our partnership with Kaiser, I mean, I, I'll ask them, like, do you think of us as a, as a health partner or do you think of us as a you know, community CDC place-based you know, organization? And they said, no, absolutely, a health partner because 10% you know, of, the, of the work around health is, is actually in a doctor's office or 20%, or whatever you know, that case may be. I know it's, um, I'll, I'll leave it to the, the doctors to, to talk about that later, Dr. Wood to, to address that. But I think, you know, so the majority of the time of the social determinants health occurs outside of the doctor's office, which we play a major role and we have for decades, right? And I think we're very good at it. So I think now it's like, you know, how do we um, kind of grow those partnerships and not, not just with Kaiser, but, you know, we're, we're surrounded with other um, hospitals, whether it's Children's Hospital, the Benioff Children's Hospital, with John Muir Health uh, farther east out in Concord and Walnut Creek where, where we have a presence. I think now it's like engaging them because I think they are they are excited about the, the, making that connection. And like Allison said, they, these, these for us, it's kind of relatively new, but it's also it's very exciting because I think it, it aligns very much with the work that has been you know, happening in these hospitals for years, but now we actually have the connection and um, we, we actually have like the, the deck to, to, to show what, what it means and, and how these partnerships can really benefit one another. So we're, we're really excited about it right now. Great, thank you, Chris. Kim, as a national CDFI, LIF has a long history of investing in place-based projects to improve health and well-being. How is LIF positioning itself in front of hospitals and healthcare systems, and what current projects are you most excited about? Thanks, Rini, um, and thanks for having me here today. Although I will say, being in New York, I feel like I'm missing out a little bit. No, no, no parades in New York today. Um, <laughs> So uh, LIF is a national CDFI. We were founded 34 years ago and we're headquartered in San Francisco with offices in New York and Los Angeles, New York, DC and Atlanta. Um, and our, mis our mission is poverty alleviation and our primary tool is capital. And we invest through our program areas, affordable housing, education, early care and education, equitable transit, healthy food and health services. And you probably recognize all of these program areas as social determinants of health on a standalone basis. Um, and we also actively seek opportunities to invest in holistic approaches to community development that are both people and place-based and evidence-based um, and span all of our program areas. And we think that that approach has the best chance of moving the needle on poverty and creating healthy communities. So given this alignment between community development and health, we have been partnering with the health sector in numerous and growing ways. Um, I want to note here also that Building Healthy Places Network really facilitates these kind of partnerships, bringing together community development players and health systems, and that's been important to us here at LIF. Um, so first, and maybe most simply, uh, one of the ways we work with the health sector, um, the, the more progressive health systems, some of them have created programs to invest in the social determinants of health. And one of the ways they do that is through intermediaries like LIF and other CDFIs. We are mission aligned and provide a platform, a ready-made platform, um, through which we do origination and underwriting and asset management. So we provide that capacity to the health system while also tracking outcomes. One example of a health system with such a program is Trinity Health. Trinity is dedicated to making a positive impact on the social determinants with a focus on underserved communities and a particular emphasis on the needs of women and children, which aligns nicely with LIF. So we have a below market line of credit with Trinity. And because it's at the enterprise level, it gives us maximum flexibility when making community investments. Um, I also want to highlight three examples of LIF investments in the social determinants of health that have been supported by partnerships with the health sector in a variety of ways. 
Um, my first example is Lyft's Equity with a Twist. Our $6 million pilot was funded uh, $3 million from the J.P. Morgan Health Foundation and was matched $3 million by Lyft. And this is a prime example of why health systems choose to invest with Lyft. So Equity with a Twist is an innovative financial tool that provides flexible financing to community quarterbacks undertaking highly integrated projects, all with mixed income housing and K-12 education and child development. And we recognize that community quarterbacks were undertaking these complex transformational efforts that often took decades um, and while the project-based capital for their work is generally available, capital at the quarterback level, uh, at the enterprise level, was not. So recipients of the low-cost tenure financing from Equity with the Twist must track outcomes metrics related to, of course, health, population health, education, public safety, and local market strength. And in this way, we can track the effectiveness of this integrated model on um, supporting vibrant and healthy communities. One of our first three investments was with Bridge Housing to support its work in Potrero in San Francisco, redeveloping public housing there under the HOPE SF program. The effort encompasses the replacement of more than 1,300 public housing units and the addition of another 1,700 homes with a range of affordability. And it also includes rethinking the whole street grid, adding open and recreational spaces, new community centers, early care and education, and retail. The second investment I want to highlight is where a health service provider, in this case, an accountable care organization or ACO, is providing a revenue stream that can be lent against by a CFI. The organization leading the effort is community serving, and the program is called Food Medicine, and it's in Boston, Massachusetts. This is providing New Market Tax Credit equity and debt for the development of its facility to house its operations as well as related nonprofits. Um, for context, the Massachusetts CMS waiver targeted flexible service dollars for ACOs focused on the social determinants of health. The community servings is contracted by um, with ACOs to provide culturally appropriate, uh, medically tailored, home delivered meals to high cost home patients. The community servings works with ACOs and researchers to evaluate uh, the impact of medically tailored meals provided through these health insurance funds. Um, and one study showed a 16% net reduction in average monthly healthcare costs for patients uh, receiving meals. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is currently funding a study to evaluate the Food is Medicine program, uh, measuring impact on healthcare expenditures, inpatient hospitalizations, and ER visits in severely and nutritionally vulnerable adults. And those results are expected next summer. My last example is Central City Concern, a project in Portland, Oregon, where Lyft provided $10.5 million of new market tax credit allocation and a $6.3 million permanent loan to Central City Concern uh, for the building of the federally qualified health center and a respite care facility in conjunction with 379 units of affordable, supportive, transitional housing. Between the low income housing tax credit financing the housing, the new market tax credit um, equity financing the community facility portion, there was still a gap of $22 million. And that was filled by the community benefits obligation of a collaborative of five hospital systems and a nonprofit healthcare plan. At the time, in 2017, this $22 million community benefit investment in housing was the largest in the country. And I think it's a great example to end with because it shows what can be accomplished through the collaboration of the healthcare system, the affordable housing sector, um, and a CDFI. So we'll leave back to you. Great. Thank you, Kim. And if you're interested in reading more about equity with a twist or some of the examples that Kim mentioned, um, we did just chat in some resources for you. And um, we'll be coming back to some of the themes that both Chris and Kim touched on in terms of metrics um, and kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what these collaborations look like. So thank you again. 
Um, Camilla, let's move to you. You have a unique role as a physician and a public health practitioner working at a national affordable housing network. Reflecting on your experiences working both within the healthcare sector and in affordable housing at SAFE, what opportunities for partnership have yet to be fully leveraged? Sure, and thank you so much for uh, that kind introduction, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, SAFE, um, as mentioned, is a national collaborative of nonprofit affordable housing providers, and we have been working for several years to develop partnerships within the health sector. One of the items I wanted to highlight was an activity we did back in, uh, starting in 2014, where we did matchmaking activities with Medicaid MCOs. We actually worked with health management associates who helped to do an environmental scan regarding Medicaid MCOs that were really interested in investing around the social determinants of health and matched them with our members on the ground to do focal and specific programmings to impact residents and affordable housing properties. Um, there was a lot of work that went into that and there uh, were a lot of lessons learned and we published a report last April um, called uh, Path to Partnership, not to be confused with what was mentioned today, that kind of goes over those lessons learned. But even in that work, we realized that there's so much to be done. Um, there has been a lot of work with partnering with Medicaid around some housing programming, a lot of times that focuses on high utilizers or super utilizers, and that's not always the residents we serve. Oftentimes, they are low-income children and families as well that might not always meet that criteria. So we realize that there's still a lot of conversation that needs to be had around who you're serving and what are the benefits of partnering, particularly on the payer side, uh, that can be beneficial. In addition to working with Medicaid, um, I find that community benefit kind of bringing in my healthcare lens is kind of this place that is still not tapped um, into its capacity. And Allison mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, there are definitely opportunities for housing providers, uh, CDCs and CDFIs to partner in, with hospitals around community benefit, particularly the community health needs assessment and how do you insert their kind of community assessment, not just around some of the general health metrics, but some of the other social determinants of health, including housing and what's happening in the actual community. Um, I know community benefit could be a lot of a kind of a black hole to some external stakeholders, but I do think there's a lot of room there to work work together, um, particularly in not just looking at programming around services and who you're serving, but also investments in infrastructure. And there's a lot of great work happening in the field to kind of push the envelope there to ensure that hospitals and health systems are also taken outside their comfort zone to think about how they can have a greater impact in their community beyond just that service delivery model. This is something that SAFE is absolutely working towards figuring out how we can be more engaged in and definitely think it's an untapped source that um, we can, we're very excited to see what happens in the future and all the great work that's coming from the field. Hello. Um, so now we're going to turn to our audience. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions both prior to and during our discussion. Um, we actually received, I think, over 50 questions um, and they continue to come via chat. So please do keep sharing your questions using the chat box on your right or via Twitter using the hashtag network commons. Um, so to start, you know, for, for um, hospitals that are fairly new to community development, what kind of language or numbers should community developers use to convince them of the value of that partnership? And maybe we can start with Kim for that question and then we can move to others in the group. Sure, um, so I think that, uh, I guess I'd say a couple things there. One, in talking to hospitals and health systems, I think sometimes there's a misperception that um, everything has to be done via community benefits, i.e. a grant. And the fact that you can invest in affordable housing, that invest in community facilities, and actually get a, get a return of capital and a modest financial return, as well as a social admission return, I think that there's not a great understanding of that. So one of the things we try to do at the outset is to um, explain our track record and the, the, the track record in general of the affordable housing sector, the CDFI sector, in terms of the fact that there are very few negligible uh, losses and that you know we have a, a tremendous amount of impact and outcomes, uh, and 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 also frankly a return of capital and a modest and, and a and a 
modest financial return. So I think that's important. Um, and then I think explaining the kinds of things that we can do that obviously aligns well with social determinants of health, whether it be housing or early care and education or the food is medicine project. I think sometimes that, um, I think sometimes there's not an awareness of really the spectrum of the work that the community development sector, the CDC sector, um, uh, you know, practices. Great. Thank you. Any uh, any comments from others in the group? Well, I, I'll just maybe jump in real quick. I think, you know, yeah. the, you know um, communicating with hospitals or, or whatever the case may be, I think with us, you know, I always try to emphasize that we're on the front lines, right? We're in the community. We're um, in East Oakland. We're in a very, in a, in a very challenged um, area with, um, uh, you know, on the front lines of the displacement, the economic inequality, the health issues, and the stress that it puts on these families. So if we're, we're seeing this stuff on a daily basis, up close and personal, and we need help, right? So I think, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's a good investment for them to look at kind of how do we strengthen certain programs, especially around early child education. Um, I was just talking to our health advocate uh, about a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, I was surprised at, like, how much work they are doing as far as um, the doctors that from different hospitals that have been out there from Kaiser and other other partners um, over the past couple months, nurses from that are you know in school right now that are coming out and, and putting their hours in the, in the community. So there's a lot of touch points that um, we need to elevate to them that things that are already happening that they can build upon. But um, for us, I mean, we're literally on the front lines of this this work in the Bay Area right now, and I'm sure there are other parts of the, of the, of the country that have similar pressures in these communities. So we see firsthand um, the, the, the toll that is taken on a lot of these families, just trying to live here, just, you know, uh, find, um, you know, good quality jobs um, and move along in their education system. So I think they all play a role, a role in this. And I think now it's just kind of describing how do you get, how do you engage them and how do they kind of jump into this, um, I don't want to call it fight, but it is, it is, um, you know, just challenging times right now. And there is a role for them. Great. I would add Thank too you. that community yeah. development organizations have this deep understanding of neighborhood conditions, one that families grow up in, and two that patients come home to. And not only do they have that knowledge, but they have the trust of communities and an awareness of the community resources and assets that have been there for, for decades. Um, and these kinds of neighborhood relationships and organizational relationships and knowledge are super valuable to a hospital. They're not the experts in this kind of stuff. And they know that building trust and relationships like the ones that community development organizations have take a lot of time and resources. So it doesn't make sense to start from scratch. That, that's a good point. If I could just jump in real quick. That's a really yeah, good point. Yeah, please. Because a lot of times I'll tell our staff, I'll even tell our board, hey, you know, a lot of our clients, they don't really know exactly what we do, but they trust us, right? How do they know they trust us? They bring us their kids every morning, or they bring us their parents or trying to get their parents into our housing, whatever the case may be. So there's this trust that 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 we have, which I think is very valuable. Um, so I just wanted to kind of follow up that I think that's really important. Thanks. Great. And any anything from you, Camilla, on what kinds of numbers and language community developers should use with hospitals to make the case? You know, for us as affordable housing providers, we often try to talk about what is it about working in affordable housing and working with those residents, which are often clients of a health system, that makes us different in that partnership. A lot of that has been touched on on the previous comments, but understanding the trust element, we often have resident service coordinators, property managers that work with our residents on a day-to-day -day basis and are intimately involved in understanding what's happening. And so that kind of gives us an added value and partnering with a hospital hospital and health system where you can really think collaboratively about the issues you're trying to address and really trying to find holistic solutions. So we try to frame it as almost like a comparative advantage and kind of working in that context and having, you know, a group of affordable housing residents that might serve as a hospital and health system and how we can better um, improve their outcomes collectively. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're getting a number of questions through the chat box, which I want to make sure to get to. Um, I will start with this question, and I think this kind of builds on some of what we already talked about. Um, so for hospitals that have already kind of demonstrated a particular commitment to their local community, 
what, what is the best way to engage them? And I think this touches on the four step path. Um, so perhaps we can maybe start with Allison and then, um, then maybe we can have others kind of chime in. Sure. Um, so I think a great way to get in on the ground that Camilla mentioned is the community health needs assessment where hospitals have to engage community organizations to learn about what the most pressing needs are. And then from there, the community benefits are supposed to follow what's been identified in the needs assessment. And so there's really an opportunity there to kind of shape um, and make a commitment to those issues that have been identified. And um, getting involved on community benefit um, boards and um, those kinds of organiz organizations can help to shift that focus towards um, social determinants of health. And then once you kind of set the frame and kind of introduce this way of thinking that's maybe a little bit beyond what hospitals have traditionally thought of, then you can start to kind of bring in the other um, types of opportunities that Kim mentioned. Um, even beyond community benefits. So those can include the investments um, that, that Kim mentioned, yeah. Um, I'll just add that um, I, I also think that there is um, an opportunity for hospitals um, and health systems generally to think about leverage. They're not, it, health systems don't think about leverage from a dollar perspective the way we do. So, uh, you know, they could perhaps have identified a need in their community needs assessment um, that feels, um, you know, overwhelming and very large from a dollar's perspective. But, you know, they can, you know, invest a dollar and through working with affordable housing developers or CDFIs or CDCs kind of leverage that with other sources. And so their dollar can really be transformed into $5 or $10. And, and the fact that that is, um, that that's available to them and that's possible. I think that's not something that they intuitively understand without talking to, you know, folks like us. So I think that's another, uh, that, that's another positive to having that conversation or way to have that conversation. One thing that I just, I will add, and this is kind of more of a practical sense, and I've, I think I've been reflecting on this on SAFE's work, but to the steps that Allison pointed out, I think sometimes there can be some unrealistic expectations on how fast this can happen. Um, I definitely think this is relationship building and hospitals are at different uh, time points in the spectrum of wanting to be engaged and really kind of respecting that, but still pushing them to think differently. Um, and so I, I think that this is a really a long game uh, activity that there are some hospitals that are going to jump on it and get the financing up front and have the right people at the table. And there are others where it's going to be a little bit more challenging. The other thing I will add is that I think through the steps that Allison brought up, it's also important to leverage that to understand how the hospital and health system leadership structure functions and figuring out who are the right people to talk to. Because sometimes there might be a disconnect and you know that might be something that's important in developing that partnership. And the last thing I'll say is that not every health system and hospital is the same. So what you do at Bon Secours and Baltimore will be different than what you do in Bon Secours and Richmond. And so I think that diversity is important to understand also as you're thinking about where the hospital is and how do you foster that relationship moving forward. And Chris, um, are there any examples that come to mind from your work with Unity Council in terms of um, how you've kind of deepened your relationship with, you know, hospitals like Kaiser or some of the other hospitals that you've been talking to recently? Yeah, I think, so for us, we've kind of went through maybe a different path, it, you know, more kind of through the foundation path. So we, we have, um, I think, really good partnerships with the San Francisco Foundation, uh, the California Endowment, um, especially the endowment around our Boys and Men of Color work and through the School of Faith Health Centers, which we've been partnering with them for almost seven years and so they've kind of introduced us to to other other folks so they, they, that's been a really strong partnership and then the california healthcare foundation also to help us kind of map out our work and, and being able to partner with um you know your organization so the, so it's kind of like we built this foundation built this foundation with these foundations to help kind of leverage that to to engage the the other hospitals the kaisers the setters and the John Muir folks that, that are out there, but it really kind of gave us some time to think about how how our work is aligns with what they do. And I think the other thing that I would just want to throw out um, to other CDCs around the country is 
how you, how your boards think about you, right? Some of the your boards may not even think that you have a role in this in the health field, or you ha you're making an impact there, which you really are. So I think you know it's, part of it is not only you know you're you're learning as an organization, but you really have to make sure that your leadership, your especially your board, is engaged and understands the impact uh, that you're having in, in the communities and how you can leverage these the work you're doing with these um, hospitals and other other partners, potential partners. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I think those are all great points. And, and it actually does relate to a question that we got in um, about where to start. I mean, we just talked about, you know, how to kind of continue to make headway with those hospitals that, you know, believe in this and, and are mission aligned. Um, but if you are a community based organization, new to this concept of partnerships with hospitals and, and just learning about social determinants of health, where, where do you start? Um, and maybe, um, maybe Allison, let, let's start with you and then you know, I'd, I'd like to hear from the other folks too. Sure, so those kind of fundamental questions that I talked about, um, kind of getting everyone on board internally is a really important foundation to set before you go off and try and make connections with healthcare. So it's really thinking about how your work is part of social determinants of health, the housing work you do, the relationship building that you do. Um, it can be helpful to start thinking about ways to measure these kinds of activities. And the network has a microsite called Measure Up with, a, with a, a lot of tools and resources that can be helpful in helping you plan for cross-sector partnerships. Um, thinking about logic models, how your work kind of leads to health outcomes um, is also a really good activity to go through internally. Um, Metrics for Healthy Communities is one site that provides examples of short, medium, and long-term outcomes. Um, getting a sense for how partners in your community are already working with hospitals too can help you kind of frame um, your strategy for partnership moving forward as well. And as I mentioned before, um, community health needs assessments have to be conducted by nonprofit hospitals and they are required to collaborate with public health departments. So if you have a relationship with your public health department, I would encourage you um, to explore how you can get involved in those kinds of processes. And I just wanna emphasize the fact that every little interaction counts in building trust and relationship with a health partner. So even at community events, you can invite a hospital to come see the work that you're doing. Um, and with that, you start to build a foundation for um, more engaged partnership later on. Great. Camilla, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on, on this question about where to start. Yes, if you're I new to this. Yeah, I wanted to second Allison's last remark about partnering with your local public health or health department. I think it's a sometimes a, a not immediate thought for some community-based organizations or CDCs. Um, but thinking about other partners in the community that might be doing similar work to Allison's point and leveraging that relationship so that when you're coming to the hospital, you don't have to come as a solo entity. I think it's also um, important to think, how do you go with other partners? Um, I also think uh, to Chris's point, uh, leveraging almost kind of a third party who might have a closer relationship with a hospital health system is another good way of doing that. So foundations like California Endowment or you know other organizations, we use health management associations when we did our Medicaid ma matchmaking, which is a consult, excuse me, a consulting firm, but someone who knows that language and can also potentially help as a translator as you're trying to figure out where your synergies are. I think that's also a great point to, to start is figuring out who can act as that liaison and kind of, you know, maybe give you that credibility if you're a smaller organization and kind of figuring out how to navigate that system. So um, I think that's another important point to take into consideration. Great. Um, and I just saw there's so many questions coming in. So we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, this question, maybe we can start with Chris and Kim for this one. Um, there have been a couple of questions that come, come that have come in around community engagement. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of the the collaboration between the organizations themselves and community development and health. But where does community engagement um, fit into that process, and how can 
community developers, particularly, ensure that residents' needs and concerns are part of the process. So, Chris, can, why don't we start with you? Sure, sure. So, um, so we're blessed here in the Fruitvale to have a really strong partnership with La Clinica de la Raza, um, which has been, you know, in in the Fruitvale for almost as long as we have, probably 45 years. And so, anything around health. That I'm not sure about. I could go to Jane Garcia, their CEO or her team, to, to advise us on on kind of things that are kind of floating around the, the health arena that we're not experts on. And so she's just been a great great partner. They they've been a great partner in pretty much everything that we do. Um, so there's so we just have a lot of synergy around um, community partnerships and engagement with working with La Clinica. Um, right now, we are partnering with another CDC, Oakland CDC, uh, called Ebalsi, uh, and we are uh, co-developing uh, uh, 94 units of affordable housing uh, right next to the existing Fruitvale Transit Village. So I think with that collaboration, there was a lot of community um, engagement around the actual development of the, the building, but also the services that are, are gonna be providing. Um, it's, it's primarily 94 affordable townhomes, so heavy emphasis on uh, for, for families, and then 21 of the units are gonna be reserved for formerly homeless veterans, again, with support services in, in the building. And I think as we develop that building, there's uh, it, it lends itself to a lot of community engagement uh, with the local schools, uh, a lot of other organizations. Um, so I think that's kind of how we, um, that's an example of some of the community engagement we, we do around co-developing. Yeah, great. Hey, I, how about you? Yeah, community engagement is critical. And LIF as a capital partner is not, like we're one removed from say like Chris's organization who's on the ground, but we always ensure that we're working with community partners uh, that are very focused on that. Two examples I can think of is uh, we have ha we have a long-standing in-depth relationship with purpose-built communities. They have their community quarterback model, and uh, that's really what is unique about their work and at the center of their work. Um, and the fact that the community quarterback is all about setting that table and and having community engagement, I think, is really important to lift. The other. Uh, example is our SPARK program, uh, which is all about uh, resilience and infrastructure and equity, um, and it's providing funding for these tables. There are six around the country. For example, last a month or two ago, I was in Atlanta. That community table has 32 community groups, right, that are sitting there and working together to kind of figure out how they want to approach equity and infrastructure um, and climate resiliency. And so a uh, really critical part of the work. There's lots of different ways to do it and to approach it, but it has to be central. Great. Yeah. Um, so we, oh yeah, go ahead, Alex. I was just gonna add one example that we do have in the playbook comes from Interim CDA, which is a community development corporation in Seattle. And they do a community survey um, on a routine basis to kind of help them guide their strategic plan. And they had found that concerns about safety um, and other kind of environmental and neighborhood level concerns kind of matched what their hospital partner, they're part of the Build Health Challenge, um, but their hospital partner identified these health disparities too. And that kind of deep engagement with communities through their surveying helped them make the case that um, health, like this was a health issue that um, needed to be addressed. Um, and the, safe, the city ended up, um, I think, committing a fair amount of money to improving neighborhood conditions and safety concerns. Um, so that those deep community surveys that um, community development corporations do are a key part of engagement. And also community development organizations can kind of bring forth that tradition of being a steward and lifting up um, community residents as leaders, that should really be the cornerstone of any kind of um, development work and partnerships with hospitals. And they can help hospitals kind of keep that in mind. Some know, but others kind of do engagement in more of a, not as deep of uh, an engagement as should be. Great. Camilla, any thoughts on the community engagement piece of partnerships? Sure. Um, so as a part of the work that we do, SAFE um, collects a variety of different data metrics to kind of help 
And when you're approaching a health entity, kind of being able to tell a data-driven story just versus an anecdotal story. But a big part of that is our community engagement. And so we do a resident, many of our members do a yearly resident uh, services survey where they're not just asking questions that are a part of the kind of HUD recommendations around income and some of the other things that we could do for reporting, but actually asking them about access to education, access around um, uh, healthy foods and food security questions. Um, and really getting a sense of what's happening. And so the voices of our residents really help to inform the work that we try to do as we partner with these healthcare entities. And so that's a really large focal point of really being able to form that partnership. Great, thank you, Camilla. And I'll, I'll mention that um, one of the survey instruments that SAFE uses, the outcome measures, I'm, I hope I'm getting this right, the outcome, <laughs> health outcome measures tool, is actually on our Measure Up microsite. So if you visit Measure Up, you can actually take a closer look at exactly the kind of survey instrument that um, Camilla is referring to. And I think Camilla, your comments actually relate really well to a number of questions that we got before the event and during the event around, a little bit more around metrics. Um, just building on the first question, um, what are the, the metrics that hospitals um, would like to, to see to understand how they're benefiting from these partnerships. And um, Kim, maybe we can start with you and maybe um, I wonder if the Equity with a Twist program and some of the specific outcome measures that you look at for, for that program might, might be a great example to share with, with the audience here and any other examples that come to mind as well. Sure, so um, as a CDFI, um, so we think it's important, uh, outcomes clearly are important, uh, important to measure, uh, but we also try to, uh, with equity with a twist, make it almost as easy as possible. We, we didn't want it, to, we didn't want outcomes tracking to be a burden. And so we do track, we, we tried to simplify and we came down to five things, public safety, some measure of population health, some measure of early care and education, school readiness, um, some measure of K through 12, and we kind of focused on third grade reading and math, and then um, uh, some, some measure of market vibrancy. Um, and, and we let the um, equity with the twist recipients actually as long as they measured something in those categories, if they were already doing, you know, they are all are, were already doing outcomes measurement to pick something that worked for them. Um, so for example, third grade reading scores is something that I think most of our equity with a twist recipients are measuring. It is academic research has shown it is indicative of how, uh, you know, outcomes through school and post school. Um, and so, uh, for us, it was trying to um, focus on outcomes and not make it a burden. We've also directed people to our, so, our uh, social income, or excuse me, social uh, impact calculator. Uh, it's an open source tool. You can find it on our website. Uh, and it, again, it uses academic research where if you put in some basic data about a project, like number of seats in a school, the district that it's in, so it can compare those school results to average district results and then translate that into kind of a lifetime income number for the um, graduates of that school. So it, again, it's kind of a easy to use tool, um, but still one that will report on, on outcomes. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts on what metrics are best for showing to hospitals what the direct benefit of these investments are to them. So, you know, I'll say the, the lowest hanging fruit would be uh, kind of the healthcare access metrics. So as a part of SAFE's outcome metrics that we collect, we will ask about emergency room use, whether or not you have insurance. Again, just telling a story to the hospital that's more than, hey, can you do this diabetes education class? It's kind of understanding kind of these other elements. And I think that's a great place to start because I think that's a shared language. We all know that healthcare access is an issue. We know that that's a priority of the hospital. How can we work Work together to reduce unnecessary utilization I think is a great place to start but as you kind of have these more upstream conversations I think 
you can really build on some of the community safety issues that are often, if you know, for us, if our affordable housing property is in the neighborhood with a hospital, everybody is experiencing that kind of safety concern and how you can collaborate around that and how do you measure that so that you can bring that data to the table as well and also show that you're innovative and being very thoughtful and thinking about what things you want to address. Um, and I think that can then go into food security and other issues that are on the front of the mind of the hospital and trying to figure out how do we address this? How do we measure it? And when you come with those measurements and that data, that really, I think, helps to create some inertia there to figure out how you can collaborate as partners to address specific issues. So, you know, again, I think it's healthcare access as a first starting point, but there's definitely other metrics and other domains around education, food security, and the like that can really garner a lot of attention as well. Great. And I'll, I'll just add, um, at Build Healthy Places Network, we've been working on a project that exactly addresses this question. Um, later this summer, we'll be releasing the findings of what we're calling a community development health ROI model, which builds on the social impact calculator that um, Kim mentioned that was produced by Lyft. And what we've done is we've taken some of what Lyft has done built on it with existing academic research and created an economic model that would allow community developers to actually assign a monetary value to the kinds of health outcomes that could be produced from doing holistic community development investments. So if you think about something like um, you know, the, the value of, of overall prevention in terms of cost savings to hospitals, you know, how you can actually kind of put some numbers around that and present to a hospital, hey, if you invest in affordable housing with an on-site clinic, you could potentially, you know, save this much money. Um, so stay tuned for, stay tuned to our website this summer for the findings of that research and, um, and definitely, you know, look at, you know, the social impact calculator and some of the other kind of resources that are available on Measure Up. Um, but yeah, and I, I, want to just take note of time. We are just about at time. There were a couple of questions that came in around how community organizations should navigate the healthcare system and what the healthcare playbook is about. And um, we will be chatting in the four step path to partnership, which kind of outlines that. And please do stay tuned for the healthcare playbook, which should be coming out um, hopefully in the next few weeks, which will answer those questions more fully. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank our audience for your excellent questions, and I want to thank again Chris, Kim, Camilla, and Allison for joining us today. Um, and I also would really love to thank Mia Kirk, Daniel Lau, and Jacob Craybill from the Build Healthy Places Network team who worked tirelessly to produce this event and make it possible. So thank you to the team. Um, if you missed any portion of today's discussion, we will be posting the highlights on the Build Healthy Places Network YouTube channel. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about cross-sector collaboration, and if you'd like to attend future events like this one, be sure to sign up for our newsletter with the link in the chat box. Well, thank you, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.